at uh, 5 p.m. We're going to have an open house of uh, faculty, of students, to let people uh, know what we're doing and to try to sort of reach out to the people in the university who have not heretofore uh, been part of the center's activities. So spread the word to any and all of your friends and you know in any of the disciplines um, uh, and uh, the other things uh, uh, that I some of you may know almost all of them let me reiterate them uh, uh, there will be a panel about the American election the day after which I believe is November the 7th so keep your fingers crossed and vote especially if you're from Texas <laughs> and um, <laughs> Uh, which Vanessa is, and um, we'll also show a, um, uh, uh, we'll have a screening of James Baldwin's, uh, uh, the documentary film about James Baldwin, I Am Not Your Negro, and that will be um, uh, uh, as a prelude to the talk by Robert Reed Farr, who runs the Gender and Sexuality Studies um, program at Harvard, and he'll be talking about James Baldwin. Um, that's on November the 8th. And then uh, the following week, Tim Raphael, who runs a center on uh, migration uh, and a program called Newest Americans. Uh, it's all about immigration, and uh, Newark, New Jersey is, in fact, the most diverse city in the United States, and he does media with these newest immigrants in a variety of forms. So he's here to speak to us. He's involved in um, some uh, uh, programs with civic engagement here, too. So that's what we're doing in the near future. We're honored today to have uh, a good friend of mine and a really extraordinary cultural historian, David Shumway, is a professor of English at um, Carnegie Mellon, and um, the, um, the center that you run is, is, is called the Center for Arts and Society, is that? No, the Center for the Humanities. Sorry, it's called? The Center for the Humanities. Center. Well, actually it's called the Humanities Center. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the Humanities Center at Carnegie Mellon, which you may know, is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and one of um, the really great universities in the United States. Um, uh, David, in addition to being a professor of English and the director of the Humanities Center at Carnegie Mellon, um, teaches uh, in American culture and cultural theory. His special interests include film, popular culture, late 19th and 20th century fiction. His theoretical interests concern the historical and institutional production of knowledge, cultural politics, and theories of identity. He's the author of uh, Michel Foucault, one of the earliest books in English on uh, Foucault. Um, uh, Creating American Civilization, a Genealogy of American Literature as an Academic Discipline. Uh, Modern Love, Romance, Intimacy, and the Marriage Crisis, which looks at romantic uh, comedies, among other things. Um, uh, he is the co-editor of uh, Knowledge's Historical and Critical Studies and Disciplinarity, um, Making and Selling Culture and Disciplining English. Um, his most uh, recent uh, books are American Idol, Seven Rock Stars as Cultural Icons, and a book on the American filmmaker John Sayles, which is entitled what, David? John Sayles. John Sayles. Um, who's Probably, like August Wilson, whom uh, uh, David will speak about today, one of the most underappreciated American artists outside the United States. People don't really seem to know his work outside of the U.S., and I would argue that of his generation of filmmakers, he's arguably um, one of the most significant. Um, as well as being a novelist and an extraordinary prose writer and a screen doctor or whatever, a very, very important figure. Um, and then uh, uh, David's most recent book is um, a, a project which looks at realism across media in the U.S. during the 20th century. Um, so it, it's uh, film, um, uh, theater, um, uh, fiction, um, 
whatever, and uh, maybe he will cover some of that. Today he's going to um, talk to us about August Fools. And yesterday we had a screening of a very interesting film, which I'm happy to lend to anyone, um, uh, uh, which is a documentary from PBS on uh, public television in the United States from August Wilson, the ground on which I stand is uh, what it's called. Again, Wilson, because he's a playwright um, and not a lot of his plays have been made into films, Fences is one of the exceptions you may have seen with Denzel Washington, but um, they've not been made into films, so again, people uh, even in the U.S. do not uh, necessarily know his work and yet he's acknowledged to be one of the principal, most important playwrights in the 20th century in the United States. So with that overly long introduction, um, David, welcome back to AUB. We hope you'll be coming and joining us many times. Thank you, Robert. Um, so yes, this, this talk is taken from a chapter in progress in the book that Robert just mentioned on realism, um, which basically argues for the continued cultural significance and aesthetic vitality of realism in the 20th century and beyond. Uh, it looks at realism in film, print fiction, television, and theater. And one of the things I try to do in the book is to talk about how realism differs in each of these media, um, that the, the, not so much the mechanical conditions of these things, uh, for example, the fact that film is projected or television is washed um, on small screens, but rather the, the cultural and economic conditions of production of these things limit the way realism or make possible certain ways that realism can manifest itself. Um, for example, uh, a, f uh, a commercial film can only be a certain length if it's going to make any money. So unless you have uh, Vivian Lee and uh, Clark Gable and a, a best-selling novel, people aren't going to sit through four hours of, of film. Um, and so films cannot uh, give you a narrative on the scale of um, Middle March uh, or German Um So those are the kinds of things I've been trying to talk about, but only after, in the book, first taking up the theoretical challenge posed to realism by post-structuralism in the 1970s and 1980s, a challenge that has left a lasting impression on literary and cultural studies where post-structuralist claims about realism are routinely passed off as settled law. And in the United States today, post-structuralism is not really, except in a few rarefied precincts of NYU and uh, several other universities, much, in, much discussed anymore. Some of it's taken for granted in ways that I think are appropriate, but other, other, in other instances, as with its discussion of realism, um, people seem to often just assume that um, the post-structuralists dismissed realism appropriately and we don't need to worry about this anymore. And so I'm trying to uh, argue with that um, set of assumptions. As instance most influentially by Roland Barthes, this dismissal of the referentiality of the text, post-structuralism provided the basis for what became the dominant view of realism in both film and literary studies in the US after 1980. Previously, the dominant new criticism had tended to belittle much realist fiction, but it took mimesis in literature more or less for granted. Critics such as Georg Lukács, Eric Auerbach, and André Bazin had made powerful theoretical arguments for realisms and mimesis, which, if they did not become dominant, were widely respected. But the influence of Bach and post-structuralism changed that. For Bach, what is of interest is not what a text can tell us about the world it claims to represent, but rather what it tells us about writing and reading, that is, about itself and other texts. Thus, in SZ, Barthes asserts, it is necessary to disengage the text from its exterior and its totality, unquote. If Barthes' position is extreme, it is not atypical of modernist and postmodernist criticism, 
which, uh, which has consistently been skeptical of representation and which has read works of art primarily in terms of their relations to other works of art. Since post-structuralist theorists Lacan and Derrida question the referentiality of language to core, Barth's positions seem to be all that theory allowed. Yet even before post-structuralism attacked realism theoretically, literary criticism and history in the academy had already regarded it as passé as early as the 1950s. Modernism was regarded as having replaced realism as the dominant literary mode by the 1920s, that is, in retrospect. As Toral Moy explains in her recent study of Ibsen, quote, the ideology of modernism produces an opposition between realism and modernism, understood both as formal aspects of texts and as names for distinct literary and artistic periods, unquote. The ideology of modernism, according to Frederick Jameson, is a post hoc reconceptualization by critics practicing during the Cold War of the formerly experimental literature produced earlier in the 20th century. This ideology, according to Moy, builds conception of modernism on an opposition to realism that was not fundamental at the moment when what came to be called high modernist works were produced. Moreover, realism's most important aesthetic opponent, the aesthetic of idealism, was largely forgotten, leaving realism to seem as if it were mundane and conservative even in the 19th century. Apologists for postmodernism have, if anything, been more dismissive of realism as Matthew Beaumont shows in the introduction to his edited collection, quote, in the intellectual climate identified with the name postmodernism, realism has not even been an issue. Realism has a somewhat different history and status in theater than it does in the novel or film. While one could argue that drama's history uh, is, was merely delayed, its moment of modernism emerging at mid-century rather than at its turn, theatrical modernism is hard to distinguish from postmodernism, and perhaps because the theater lies between the novel and the cinema in its ties to commercial necessities, modernism never really supplanted realism on the U.S. stage. Yet it was a playwright, Bertolt Brecht, whose critique of realism is at root of the post-structuralist conception of the mode's failings. And it was post that it was pro-modernist critics in the US, such as Robert Brustein, who failed to see the importance of August Wilson's work. It was Wilson's realism that made him seem to them unremarkable at best and an anachronism at worst. The century cycle, uh, which is Wilson's basically Wilson's body of work, consists of ten plays written between 1984, with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and 2005's Radio Golf, each of the 10 plays taking place in a different decade of the 20th century. The plays were not composed in chronological order. Ma Rainey is set in the 1920s, the next play is Fences in the 1950s, and the last two to be composed were Gem of the Ocean, the 19 aughts, and Radio Golf, the 1990s. All of the plays except Ma Rainey, which takes place in Chicago, are set in the Pittsburgh neighborhood of the Hill District, which was historically African American, and until around 1970, the cultural center of African American life in the city. Um, in Two Trains Running, in fact, Wilson um, discusses, uh, has characters discuss, the demise of that neighborhood under the um, wrecking ball of urban renewal. So basically, the city tore down the heart of this neighborhood um, in, in the name of clearing slums. Um, well, Fences is a drama of the nuclear family, and the piano lesson focuses on a brother and sister. The majority of the plays are centered around groups of African-American men, often at their place of employment. Well, reality of the reality of racial inequality is ever present in these plays. Only Ma Rainey has any white characters. Wilson's plays are about life within the African American community. The characters of these plays are responding in different ways to the condition of oppression in which they exist. 
Some struggle successfully to achieve a measure of economic and emotional stability, while others, on, on the contrary, have been severely damaged. Several characters seem to be versions of the madman or, or fool whom in the farces of the late Middle Ages, as Michel Foucault observed, reminds each man of his truth. Not surprisingly, many plays feature at least one character whose defining trait seems to be his anger. Since I can't talk about all 10 plays in this brief talk, I'll use examples from several of them, primarily Marini's Black Bottom and The Piano Lesson, um, to illustrate my broader claims about the cycle as a whole. It is my contention that Wilson's century cycle must be understood as essentially realist. And this is an argument that, um, I mean, if, in some ways, it, it may seem obvious that plays are realist, but um, Christopher Rawson, for example, in the documentary we saw yesterday was at some pains to insist that, uh, in some fundamental way, they're not realist. So I think it's an argument that, that does need to be made. Um, not only is Wilson's general motive for his project to represent Ameri African American experience during the 20th century clearly realist, but each play is in dialogue and staging in keeping with the theatrical realism that goes back to Ibsen and Chekhov and informs the American dramatic tradition of O'Neill, Miller, Hansberry, and many others. My claim, however, is that Wilson's century cycle has as much in common with the 19th century with 19th century novels as it does with these theatrical predecessors. He wants to represent the complexity of social life and its contradictions over the span of 100 years by giving us 10 dramatic moments. While both critics and proponents of, the, of realism usually write as if we all know what they're talking about, I want to specify here the defining attributes of realist narrative as it emerges in the 19th century. We recognize a narrative as realist when it meets most of the following criteria. One, it depicts contemporary or recent social life. Two, it provides a high degree of detail in its description of that society. Three, it presents psychologically and socially plausible characters. Four, it is concerned with quotidian events or ordinary life. Five, the events are plausible given the assumptions of the audience. And six, the narrative claims to reveal aspects of social life that are not normally known, confronted, or represented in art. Note that to call something realist is not to call it accurate or true, but to say that it claims a certain relationship with what it holds to be true. Realism attempts to tell the truth about certain elements of the world, but it may or may not succeed in that attempt. Realism is sometimes understood as a kind of straitjacket with strictures that prohibit aspects of human experience that do not fit with them. Wilson's realism does not limit his imagination, as the piano lesson and gem of the ocean prove. While its ghosts doubt, uh, piano lessons ghosts doubtless violate our expectations of realism, they do not compromise the power of the play's depiction of the truth of African American life. Wilson's inclusion of a spiritual dimension in most of the plays of the cycle serves to mitigate what might be perceived to be a naturalist style determinism. Wilson's plays do not offer solutions to social problems they depict, but neither do they assert that the conditions under which African Americans live condemn them to hopelessness. Theatrical realism as it emerges in Ibsen and Chekhov is most strongly associated with content rather than form. For example, what distinguishes a doll's house from typical 19th century dramas is its unsentimental treatment of marriage. Like the realism of 19th century fiction, Ibsen's plays are understood as realist in part because they deal with subjects not properly regarded as proper. But theatrical realism is not solely a matter of content. It perhaps requires a theoretically sophisticated opponent of realism, like Brecht, to make us aware of the formal devices on which such realism depends. Most famously, Brecht observed that theatrical realism depends on psychologically plausible characters, which he wanted to do away with and substitute um, the alienation effect. 
Brecht regarded the empathy which realist characters engendered in the audience a detriment to theater's ability to teach. This rejection of empathy seems today curiously dated, since we've come to regard fictional narrative's ability to produce empathy across cultural divides as one of their most important features. Lukács, the great proponent of the realist novel, makes character a key factor in his account of the form. Quote, the central aesthetic problem of realism is the adequate presentation of the complete human personality, unquote. He claims that great realist novels are built around character types. Quote, the central category and criterion of realist literature is the type, a peculiar synthesis which organically binds together the general and the particular in both characters and situations, unquote. What the theory of the type does for Lukács is connect particular characters to the social totality that he argues the realist novel presents. A character's real realism for Lukács lies neither in idiosyncrasies nor in normality, but in the presence of, quote, all of the humanly and socially essential determinants, unquote. While this conception is a mere tautology, um, that is to say, we recognize a, a character having a, a kind of complete personality if it includes everything. Um, in his reading of particular narratives, Lukács' treatment of character resembles E.M. Forster's more than it does uh, other Marxist critics. Lukács values complex, round characters because only when so drawn can they embody the, quote, essential determinants, unquote. I think Lukács' intuitions about the importance of character and realism are correct, but not for the reasons he gives. Realist works may point toward a social whole or totality, but like other works, they will always fall short. Moreover, while character types are a place where we may presume the creation of individual uh, where we may presume the creation of individual fictional characters begins, what makes them memorable and emotionally engaging are their peculiarities. We don't actually encounter types, but individuals, and it is these that realism endeavors to give us. Psychologically, real characters are always part of a larger realist presentation, which includes realisms of space, time, and language. We want a realist play on a set we watch a realist play on a set that shows us what the character's world looks like. We experience their behavior in the time that it might actually take place off stage. And the character's speech is meant to reflect the way people like that character might actually talk. So in Fences, we can recognize the type of the madman or fool behind Gabriel, a man who has suffered brain damage from a war wound. But Gabriel is much more than this. We recognize the type of the stern, punishing father behind Troy Maxson, the protagonist, but his particular circumstances define him as an individual. In theater, of course, such individuality depends on actors embodying the character on stage, a fact that may, for the duration of the performance, make the character seem quite particular indeed. In comparing theatrical realism to that video, um, to to video media on the one hand and print fiction on the other, we recognize that characters make up much more of a play than they do of a novel or a film, which in different ways present the larger world of objects and locations on a much greater scale. Indeed, it may be this dependence on character that has caused theater in general to have been the object of modernist opprobrium, expressed as part of a larger rejection of theatricality. If you reject, as many theorists working under post-structuralism did, the idea that literary characters should be understood as representations of actual human beings, then there isn't much left in a realist play that might matter. The conditions of theatrical realism limit it even more severely, though similarly, as the conditions of cinema limit filmic realism. Unlike novels and long-form TV, Movies and plays must be content with smaller stories. If filmic realism is most restricted by time, theatrical realism adds to this spatial restrictions. 
And because theater depends on human interaction, it typically can only show us one social milieu. This surely is one, one reason for the problem Lukács observed that theater typically does not deal with lower, the lower classes. The novel can tell stories that encompass different spaces, many social levels, and take place over many years. The theater is stuck with much smaller slices of life. It may seem obvious that August Wilson is a realist, but I can point to a number of essays that want to rescue him from that designation. For example, Anne Flesch, in a 1994 book chapter, argues that we must understand Wilson's treatment of the past as ironic, thus saving him from the sin of, the, of authenticity of representation. <laughs> so I want briefly to establish what I regard as Wilson's deep commitment to such representation by observing the formal realism on which his plays depend. Let us begin with Wilson's description of the setting of the piano lesson. Quote, and this is a long quote from Wilson, the beginning of the play. The action of the play takes place in the kitchen and parlor of the house where Doker Charles lives with his niece Bernice and her 11-year-old daughter, Maritha. The house, the house is sparsely furnished, and although there is evidence of a woman's touch, there is a lack of warmth and vigor. Bernice and Maritha occupy the upstairs rooms. Doker's room is prominent and opens onto the kitchen. Dominating the parlor is an old upright piano. On the legs of the piano, carved in the manner of African sculpture, are mask-like figures resembling totems. The carvings are rendered with grace and power of invention that lifts them out of the realm of craftsmanship and into the realm of art. At left is a staircase leading to the upstairs, unquote. The setting is realist. The place described as a dwelling where these characters might plausibly have lived in the 1930s when the play is set. The setting is all the more realist because the play will make clear that this dwelling exists in an identifiable neighborhood in Pittsburgh with enough clues to suggest the precise street that Wilson had in mind. The play will make it clear that the piano is a symbol, but it's worth remembering that it is also a piano. The playwright instructs that the piano be there on stage in a very particular form. The piano may justifiably be said to exceed the bounds of realism in the sense that its carvings are not typical for its time and place, but this is a good example of the way the rules of realism are selectively broken in all realist texts. The piano is important because it is not typical. If it were any old piano, there would be no reason to fight over it. With respect to time and language, the piano lesson also exemplifies theatrical realism. The play takes place over a period of five days with one three-day gap occurring in Act One. While this period might not satisfy Aristotle, it is short enough for the events to be understood as continuous, especially given that the entire play takes place in the one setting just described. Perhaps most important, the play's dialogue is an explicit attempt to capture the speech of African Americans of this social class at that time. By capture, I don't mean that Wilson is, was literally, trying literally to reproduce typical language usage as a sociolinguist might. Rather, his job as a playwright is to use language as the raw material for creating a work of art. Thus, while the general speech patterns are offered as representative, the particular sentences are intended to invite the audience into the emotional world of the play through their narrow focus and poetically heightened expression. As any number of critics have observed, one aspect of Wilson's great achievement is to demonstrate the power of African American vernacular speech. And it's important, I think, to say here that that kind of speech has been widely condemned in the United States as inferior dialect. So Wilson's insistence that this form of speaking can make high art is a really important statement all by itself. Another aspect of theatrical realism often observed is the centrality of the family in such plays. There are, I think, formal considerations that explain in part why families are so often the subject of these works in that it is always plausible that a family should be together in a relatively confined space. 
Wilson's plays sometimes follow this convention, as, for example, does Fences, but they more often depart from it by making other social groupings paramount. In the boarding house of Seven Guitars, for example, or the workplace setting of Jitney. The piano lesson is a family play, but its family is not a nuclear one of a long day's journey or death of a salesman. The play gives us an extended family of a brother and sister, their uncle and her daughter. Um, no marriage currently exists for any of these characters, though the prospect of marriage for Bernice is offered. While the relationship of father and son is the focus of fences, it is important for the concerns of the piano lesson that no fathers be present. This is a play that asks us to think about forefathers. The central conflict in the play is in one sense a very ordinary and familiar family squabble. The brother, boy Willie, wants to sell the piano so that he can buy land back home in Mississippi on which to farm. Bernice refuses to allow him to sell the piano, not because she uses it to make music, although her daughter does, but because it represents a connection to her family history. Arguments over inheritance have a long history in literature, and the piano is apparently the only significant patrimony left to the two siblings. Yet their argument is not the typical one, in that it is not primarily about the monetary value of the inheritance. While Boy Willie really wants the piano for its cash value, it's not an argument about who has received more of the total. Rather, the argument is over the meaning of the piano. To Boy Willie, really, it means the possibility of realizing his ambition to be a landowner, to escape from the landlessness in which most African Americans were left after emancipation. Bernice, at the outset, has a harder time articulating the meaning she finds in the piano. Doker first explains Bernice's refusal to play the piano. Quote, she say it got blood on it, unquote. But this we will come to realize is also the reason she refuses to allow it to be sold. As the play develops, it becomes clear that the piano embodies both in its carvings and in its history the family's struggle against the oppression of slavery and white supremacy. So we as the audience find ourselves very much in the midst of realist theater, but that realism is interrupted quite early on by talk of ghosts. One of the usual markers of realism is the adherence to the canons of belief normally taken to define truth from fantasy or fact from fancy at the moment of the work's composition. Since the dominant view in 1990 was certainly that ghosts are not real, their mention in the play risks violating this convention. Ghosts are first mentioned when Boy Willie reports that everybody say that Sutter was pushed to his death in a well by the ghosts of Yellow Dog. Boy Willie reports this as if he accepts it at face value, but Bernice tells him it is nonsense. Bernice, however, soon, in Cutter, soon encounters Sutter's ghost, who she reports seeing at the top of the stairs. Boy Willie responds to this report as if she, as she responded to his. I told you there ain't nothing up there, Doker. Bernice dreaming all that. Throughout most of the play, the ghosts exist in this liminal epistemological space, and as such, they can be written off as the mistaken beliefs of one or another of the characters. As such, they don't violate the play's realism, as real people often believe things the majority deem to be false. The ghosts are so far part of the character's reality, but not ours. In the first scene where the foregoing takes place, we do not know who Sutter is, except that he owned the land that Boy Willie wants to buy. We later learn from Dover that, quote, our family was owned by a fellow named Robert Sutter. That was Sutter's grandfather, all right? The piano was owned by a fellow named Joel Nolander. It was coming up on Sutter's wedding anniversary, and he was looking to buy his wife an anniversary present. One thing with him, he had no money, but he had some niggers. So he asked Mr. Nolander to see if maybe he could trade off some of his niggers for that piano. So Sutter lined up his niggers, and Mr. Nolander looked them over 
and out of a whole bunch, he picked my grandmother. Her name was Bernice. And he picked my daddy when he was nothing but a little boy, nine years old, unquote. While Robert Sutter's wife at first likes the piano, she soon misses the enslaved people her husband had traded. She tries to trade the piano back, but no man refuses. So Doper's grandfather, still owned by Sutter, is asked to carve the likenesses of his wife and child on the piano. But he also adds carvings of his mother and father and of key events in the family's history. Boy Willie and Bernice's father later stole the piano from Sutter, and soon afterwards, the father was murdered with three other men when he was holed up in a boxcar on a rail line called the Yellow Dog. Soon after that, one of the white men thought to be involved in the murder was found at the bottom of a well. The ghosts of Yellow Dog are said to have gotten their revenge. So far, all of this talk of ghosts can be understood as lore. But before the end of Act One, the audience hears the sound of Sutter's ghost. At the end of the play, Sutter's ghost and Boy Willie get into a fight at the top of the stairs. While the ghost himself is never seen, his physical effects are, as Willie is several times thrown down the stairs. And Wilson's stage directions tell us there are loud sounds coming from upstairs as Boy Willie begins to wrestle with Sutter's ghost whose capitalized name suggests he is considered one of the dramatis personae. The ghost is exercised by Bernice's playing the piano and calling on her ancestors for help. This settles the matter of the piano's disposition, as Boy Willie tells Bernice that she and her daughter need to keep playing the piano lest the ghost return. Sutter's ghost then becomes a part of the audience's reality, even if an unseen part, and we now come to realize that the play has moved decisively beyond the usual bounds of realism. So what are the ghosts doing in an otherwise realist play? One answer, I believe, is that they reflect the way in which people respond to oppression. Not all of Wilson's plays contain literally supernatural interventions of this kind, but virtually all of them make reference to such. So Gabriel, in Fences, believes he is been to heaven and to have met St. Peter. Aunt Esther, who appears in Gem of the Ocean, said in 1904, is said to be 285 years old, and who has recent, and, and in King Hedley, um, set in 1985, only then dies, so she dies um, at close to 400 years old. Um, she is understood by the community as a kind of spiritual healer or fixer. She describes her own methods as something like folk psychology rather than anything mystical, but her reputation assumes the latter. For Wilson, then, the very quotidian reality his plays present is not sufficient because to accept this world's limits is to accept white domination as eternal and inevitable. However, another reason uh, why these ghosts might be here uh, is the particular kind of history Wilson is seeking to represent. Wilson's history is like Faulkner's. For these characters, it isn't dead and it isn't even past. Both brother and sister feel the continued presence um, of uh, of Sutter the slaver before his offspring makes himself felt as a ghost. The, continu the continued effects of the history of slavery on these characters is not just social or economic, but deeply subjective as well. The way Wilson has chosen to embody that living history in the piano lesson is in the figure of a ghost. Even if we cannot believe in the reality of the ghost, we understand the reality of that living history. History, it may seem obvious, is a major concern of the century cycle, but Wilson's interest is not big history. Most politics, wars, and other phenomena that the mainstream culture uses to index the 20th century are missing from the play. For example, 
It has been observed that even though the events of the piano lesson take place during the Depression, that event is not even alluded to in the play. Unlike the historical novel, Wilson's plays do not give us characters on the periphery of well-known figures and events, but characters who, are, who in effect inhabit a related but different world existing simultaneously and in close proximity to the world that such novels typically describe. Part of Wilson's point is doubtless that the history that matters to the dominant culture is often irrelevant to the lives of those in the African American community. One might expect a series of plays that cover the decades of a century to reveal historical change of some sort, be it improvement, decline, or even just random variation. But the strongest sense of these ten plays, the strongest sense that these ten plays give us is of fundamental stasis. The condition of African Americans does not change significantly over the course of the cycle. But the plays do refer to actual historical events relevant to their characters. Ma Rainey is set in the 1920s when, as Michael Denning shows in The Noise Uprising, commercial sound recording suddenly expanded, expanded, making recordings by African Americans and other marginal groups in large numbers for the first time. The play takes place in a recording studio where there is a conflict not only between black, the black diva Ma Rainey and the white men who own the studio and manage her career, but also among the black musicians over the style of music to be recorded. Levy, a trumpet player, has written his own arrangement of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, um, which the white men want Ma to record. He describes the standard arrangement that the other musicians favor, and as does Ma Rainey, jug band music. And it is apparent from the way he describes this version his version that it is, it is improvis improvisatory and more up-tempo. It is exactly at this period when Louis, uh, Louis Armstrong made his famous Hot Fives and Hot Sevens recordings, which include much, many such revisions of more traditional blues. Despite Wilson's own claims, other plays do refer to public historical events that had a specific resonance or impact in the black community. Two Trains Running, set in 1969, takes the black power movement as part of its background, and Malcolm X's murder is discussed. At least one faction of these popular, one, at least one function of these popular cultural references is to establish the realism of the plays by making clear that their events happen within a larger context. Just as John Updike uses the media of radio, movies, and television to anchor Rabbit's world in a public reality, Wilson uses a more narrow and particular set of references to mark the historical moments of his dramas. This kind of history is not the most important in the century cycle, however. Wilson is most interested in the history that has directly affected the lives of African Americans, the history of racism. One example is the history which is told in the piano lesson, a history which has impacted the brother and sister who are fighting over the piano, but which neither of them has directly experienced. This history is obviously important to them, as the fight over the piano illustrates, but it is also implicitly important to African Americans in general. It illustrates that oppression long ago continues to have an impact in the present. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom demonstrates this even more directly, since here, the experience of violent oppression has been witnessed by one of the characters. Levy is made fun of by the other members of the band for the way he is sucking up to Sturdivant, the studio owner, who has, who has promised him he will record some of his songs with his own band. They accuse him of being, quote, spooked up about the white man, unquote. Levy's response is to tell the following story. I was eight years old when I watched a gang of white men come into my daddy's house and have to do with my mama any way they wanted. It was coming on planting time and my daddy went to Natchez to get him some seed and fertilizer. Called me, say, Levy, you the man of the house now. Take care of your mama while I'm gone. I wasn't but a little boy, eight years old. There was my mama with a gang of white men. She tried to fight them off, but I could see where it wasn't going to do her any good. 
I didn't know what they were doing to her, but I figured whatever it was, they may as well do to me too. My daddy had a knife that he kept around there for hunting and working and whatnot. I knew where he kept it, and I went and got it. I'm going to show you how spooked up I was by the white man. I tried the damnedest to cut one of them's throat. I hit him on the shoulder with it. He reached back and grabbed hold of that knife and whacked me across the chest with it. Levy raises his shirt to show a long, ugly scar. And that's the end of the quote. Levy continues the story by saying that his father sold their farm to one of the men who had attacked his mother and smiled in his face. Once the family was settled elsewhere, however, he left them and came back to exact revenge. Quote, he got four of them before they got him. They tracked him down in the woods, caught up with him and hung him and set him afire, unquote. This story of rape and lynching is African American's history. It is the kind of event that was not part of history as it was written until quite recently. Levy's story restores a part of history to the public record, but it is a history that African Americans have carried around inside them. Levy illustrates this, as the play strongly suggests that he has been damaged by this trauma. Levy's anger, however, is directed mainly at other African Americans. When Sturdivant changes his mind and reneges on his promise to record Levy's songs, Levy is unable to respond angrily directly to him. Rather, the play concludes with him murdering one of his fellow band members for the crime of stepping on his new shoe. It is apparent from the way this scene is written that Levy has lost control of himself, that the murder is the result of something like temporary insanity and certainly not premeditated. The scene set in the 1920s cannot help but remind us that murders of this kind happen daily in poor black neighborhoods today. Wilson's play provides a historical context for this contemporary reality. While I don't have time today to say much about Wilson's characters, I will use Levy as an example that will stand for the rest. Levy is not, not, not very likable from the first. He arrives late for the recording session and immediately shows off his new shoes, which his bandmates clearly regard as conspicuous consumption. He seems to fight with the other band members over insignificant matters. He's particularly critical of Toledo, who he will kill in the end, for his philosophizing. Toledo is the one member of the band who can read, and he's something like an organic intellectual in Gramsci's sense. Levy is an anti-intellectual, but that does not mean he is unintelligent. His speeches indeed demonstrate a native intelligence that suffers from a lack of formal education. He's also the one band member at least satisfied with the status quo. He has a plan to better himself, one which might make him the hero of a Horatio Alger story if he were white. Yet Wilson's own account of character alerts us that he is deluded about himself. Quote, he lacks fuel for himself and is somewhat of a buffoon. But it is intelligent buffoonery, clearly calculated to shift control of the situation to where he can grasp it. He plays trumpet. His voice is strident and totally dependent on his manipulation of breath. He plays wrong notes frequently. He often gets his skill and talent confused with each other, unquote. The effect of these contradictions is that we are both attracted to and repelled by Levy. We want to root for his ambitions to succeed, but we're put off by the way in which he treats his bandmates. As is typical of Wilson, there are no villains or heroes in this play. What is remarkable is that he's able to bring so many different characters to life in each play, which, except for Fences, lack, um, lacks a true protagonist. Wilson's plays succeed because his, these characters do engender empathy, often despite their many flaws. So um, I want to conclude then by saying uh, something more about why any of this matters. Um, it seems to me that today, especially, uh, given um, claims like we hear in the United States that truth isn't truth, that um, we need to be able to claim that we can talk about works of art in terms of their um, ability to represent the world truthfully. Um, when the post-structuralists were 
critic criticizing realism, it often seemed to them that the problem with knowledge was not that it was right or, or wrong in its, what it said, but that the people who controlled knowledge and discourse were limiting it by asserting things to be truth. And so the way to solve this problem was to essentially attack the ability to represent truth uh, or to claim that there was, there could be an accurate represent, representation of truth. Recent events have suggested that that diagnosis was wrong, that in fact the problem um, is not that uh, truth is hegemonic, the problem is quite the opposite, that um, the dominant forces uh, consistently deny the truth and are able to get away with it. So, thanks. Well, thank you. That's a wonderful way to end your talk, if not an upbeat way. Um, uh, do, do we have a couple of questions? I, as always, have a few of my own, but you know, I uh, would defer to anybody else if you have a question for David. Yes. I have a question about the relationship between the presence of the ghost and the argument. Yeah. Thinking about what? Avery Gordon. Yes. Uh, mostly in actors, you know, where she talks actually about the ghost in a very realistic way. Uh, because the ghosts, uh, in many ways, if they listen, they find a relation to how people experience a specific kind of reality, then actually the reality of loss makes ghosts realistic. In that sense, actually, uh, the question is. We're back to the idea of who's reality yes. is it, and then who's historical reality is it. So what would your comments be on this kind of, uh, not really dichotomy, but at least this form of pluralization of reality? Um, yeah, it's, really, it's a, actually a really interesting um, point. Um, and uh, it, it sort of reminds me of the way in which um, ghost-like figures, the, 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 the palpable presence of the dead, were so often talked about in the wake of 9-11 in the United States. The, the idea that it's hard to wrap your head around the sudden loss of uh, loved ones. Um, And I'm not, um, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I think there are cultural, cultural differences here to be sure that um, the way in which the experience of the spiritual and other dimensions of reality uh, do differ in different communities. Um, but I also think that um, even in the African American community, there is awareness that um, that ghosts are not part of normal quotidian existence. So, even if even if they are plausible in a way for that community that they might not be for whites, the introduction of them into the play is nonetheless um, a violation of that basic realist contract. Um, but I, but, I, but my argument is that it's done for very specific re reasons that are um, themselves in the service of a, of a higher or different realism. Are those, uh, they are not only those that exist, they are those that do, they are people of action. That's right. In that sense, so. Well, I would say, no, no, no. of course, there are people who, 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 um, who believe in poltergeists. And, and such phenomena which do um, leave their mark. Um, uh, that's right. <laughs>
Well, it's a fascinating representational question. It, it reminded me of uh, uh, the film version of Beloved, which um, is a colossal failure. Whereas in the novel, Beloved, and it's, you know, you see it in John, uh, this is a huge problem in theaters. How do you represent a ghost, whether you know, it's a ghost of Hamlet's father? As soon as you represent, right, in a physical space or in a physical way, and that's what the fallacy of the film version of Beloved, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but in fact, you know, uh, Oprah Winfrey put up the money, Jonathan Demme directed it. Um, Nobel Prize winning novel, what could go wrong? Well, what goes wrong is that no one will say that that physically represent beloved in this way, and I know this having seen it in, um, uh, uh, in, among an overwhelmingly African-American audience in Chicago when the play was released, and they went intentionally to support it. And as soon as beloved came out manifested, people began to laugh, right? You know, it was like, you know, it was, so it is a very interesting sort of question, is, is this kind of contract with audience? And it's true that it's something that can work in a realistic novel. We're reading Of Mice and Men today by Steinbeck, and, and talking about it's all the way through third person objective, and at the end, then of course, Lenny has a conversation with a giant rabbit, which, as soon as you try to represent that on stage or on in, in a film, it becomes a much more difficult process. And yet, we all sort of uh, uh, experience the novel as a realistic novel. But as soon as you, you know, try to grapple with that scene and representing it in a film or a play, it becomes a different problem, at least. So it's a very intriguing. You know this this idea of representing that reality or internal reality or whatever. Um, okay, I thought my last question was going to be well, organized enough for this question. Um, I appreciated your final comment about, um, and, and I think uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're gesturing towards this movement from you know, realism and uh, modernism and post-structuralism, in which post-structuralism largely um, wanted to challenge the hegemony of a master narrative, yes. you could say, as opposed to, like, like that's useful for me as opposed to a, a hegemonic truth or something, like a master narrative. Um, so then you have, you know, with sort of the various identity politics, feminist movements, and grades in the movements, this insistence that there are, that in the, you could call it a pluralization of reality, right? There are various, we're, we're like subjectivizing the truth to some extent. We're saying it's not as objective or singular as it had seemed. So what I have found in my own um, conversations is that there become, there, there's like a deadlock often that is reached where one person is, um, or one perspective is defending the possibility of an of a ultimate truth <laughs> because only then can we actually have intellectual exchange and debate and answer questions. And I am usually <laughs> um, defending the existence of multiple realities and the need for that. So I want, but I, and I think that by kind of um, like, so, so to say there's multiplicity of realities and there's some subjectivity to reality is not the same as saying there is no truth, which is your crucial point, right? Um, what do you think can be done with that kind of truth? Well, so part of, the, part of the point is that these, these epistemological questions are incredibly difficult. And, um, and I, I have to say that I think many of my colleagues trained in literary studies were not equipped to deal with them. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they didn't learn the philosophical backstories behind them. Um, so, um, the, the notion of perspectivism does not deny um, that there, there can be truths which transcend those perspectives on occasion. It simply says that there may be things that some people can see and experience that other people cannot. Um, it is, but it was often taken 
to mean that there's there's nothing we can agree upon if we if we have different if we have different standpoints, right. and, and that seems to me a mistake. Um, we may be able we may disagree about some things because of our different standpoints, but that doesn't preclude uh, there being things that we can agree on. Um, uh, moreover. Um, Uh, there, there's a kind of history here um, which many people who invoke standpoint theory don't understand. And the history is important because it, the, the term comes from Lukács, who was a, a, a Marxist. He was trying to make Marxism more philosophical and less um, empiricist. And so he went back to Hegel in History and Class Consciousness, and he argued that the, the, the kind of enlightenment that Marx forecast for the working class um, was essentially predetermined by the standpoint that the relations of production put the worker uh, or, or, or limited the worker to have. And the proletariat would come to understand the truth about capitalism because of where it existed within those relations. And, and that gave the working class this insight that other people would never have. The thing about that insight, though, is it's not at all subjective. It is, it is an objective thing that they're able to perceive because of their standpoint. Um, now, when Sandra Harding, who I believe is the, was the first feminist to directly name what she was doing, standpoint theory, took this over, I think she meant to include that um, aspect of Lukács, though she certainly meant to soften it. Um, but I think that very quickly got lost and probably not just by people who took her up, but also in her own writings. Um, and so one could, one could make the argument, in fact, that, um, that women under patriarchy are able to objectively see things that men cannot. Mm -hmm. Right, it's, not, it's a, like what you're saying, suggesting is that this is a misuse of the concept of subject. Yes. It's actually objective truth from a different standpoint. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Uh, from another angle, maybe from this, in the same discussion, I, it's really striking the piano. I was kind of very. It's this fetish object in this Marxist term, in this Marxist terminology, right? This fetish object becoming sort of used in. in it's, not a fetish, it's not a fetish object in the Marxist like, concept. Like it might be in some other okay, use so of the, the term fetish. The fetish was, 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 came out of European capitalism. The totem, which is the word that he used, the totem was that the symbol of fetish object. What Marx did with that concept was to turn it around and they sort of make a point that the fetish objects that the Europeans accuse Africans of having relationships with, with objects around them exist in European capitalist culture as the commodity. The commodity becomes the fetish object that hides its true reality. So I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that consciously, um, August Wilson was really playing with that. So to bring this object, and you know, he talks about sort of the, 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 the craft going into art, you know, in the piano. So, the, so this carving of the, of the sort of African experience into this object that, that holds both symbolic uh, existence for the family, but also has material relations, and also a commodity. It, that exists in, in, in both in both of this notion of the, of the fetish. But I think that critique of the fetish that Marx makes Right? That, that Europeans believe they have to do. Uh, that's not. Look, I'm sorry. Let me. So I've actually. But, but I have I, a book. I'm going to, 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 to this discussion then, right? So, I mean, his critique was that transcending this notion of the fetish, right? The Europeans fall into this, this other notion, which is with, with, with this other. It's, I'm other sorry, it's not what Marx says. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Marx 
Marx accepted entirely the standard anthropological conception of fetishism at his time, during his time. He believed that primitive peoples were worshipped and objects that they believed were animate. And he imports that concept to explain how um, capitalists misunderstand, just as primitive people misunderstand, the character of objects. Because capitalists believe that commodities can magically produce wealth all by themselves. Um, so Marx, Marx is actually not at all a critic of, of the misunderstanding as people would have it today of these cultures. He's simply using that misunderstanding to characterize a contemporary misunderstanding in his own world. And um, he, he doesn't, he's, he's, by the way, this is a major misunderstanding of Marx, he's not criticizing consumption. He, he has nothing to do with use value. Commodity fetishism is about capital. It's about where capital comes from. It's not Somebody who wants to buy something, a piano, a diamond, um, a, an Armani suit, even if it's conspicuous consumption, none of that is commodity fetishism in Marx's conception. Commodity fetishism is the desire, is the conception that wealth comes from commodities and not from labor. Can I finish? Yeah. So this obfuscation of labor, what I understand is what 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 Marx equating with 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 the African fetish. Yeah. Right. Like it, it is it is it, the object becomes a fetish. The commodity becomes a fetish because that the, the, the labor that produced it gets obfuscated. Right. That's right. So in in some sense, the fetish of the Europeans to the commodity and the fetish of the Africans towards the totem, he's saying is the same. He's putting it on the same plane. Right. Yeah. Am I right? So that's the point I'm talking yeah. about. Okay. So, so what I'm wondering about what you're doing by taking August Wilson and the way he's playing with, with realism and reality by bringing in, by really sort of like when weaving in the, the, the ghost or the non-real, uh, mm -hmm. what was, we consider non-real, in, in, into, into his plays, to take that play and put it back into a, a social realist mold, I'm wondering what, what, whether instead of doing that, instead of fitting Wilson into the mold of, of, of realism, ask how is it that August Wilson works is redefining realism. Do you see what I mean? I'm, I'm wondering whether, whether, whether you're committing something towards, towards, towards uh, August Wilson by insisting on a realism that he was trying to break out of, perhaps. He was trying to perhaps redefine realism. Um, well, I'd, I'd be happy to, to accept the idea that he's trying to redefine realism, because I think um, anybody who works seriously in the mode is always working at trying to redefine it. It's never a mere repetition of it. But, um, but I think it's important to understand that Wilson is genuinely ambivalent about the piano. Um, and he has he has said, if when pushed, he doesn't like to, he didn't like to answer the question, but when pushed, he said, I have more sympathy with Boy Willie than I do with Bernice. That is, he would, he would have sold the piano because its monetary value was, in the end, more important than its cultural value to him. So, he would, he would have been happy to use it as a, a, a commodity. Uh, maybe we'll have one more question, and then uh, we can go. Um, in the abstract that you sent me for the lecture, you had mentioned something about how, the, I think because of the fact that the play is set in you know, each of these different decades, it's a it's more expansive the type of realism. It, it overcomes these limitations yeah. that the single drama usually has. Right. Um, uh, because you were, yeah, so I was wondering if you could comment about that a bit because I didn't uh, pick up on much about that in your talk. Um, specifically, how it is that you see a typical realist drama being limited in time and space as opposed to these works? How you see well, that so, happening? Um, it seems to me that most realist theater 
by definition gives us a short moment in time. It can't give us historical breadth. Sometimes it, it can introduce that in characters' speeches. We can get a sense that the characters might have a, a history or a family history, but the action is limited. Um, moreover, as Lukash observes, um, theater has trouble giving us complex social interactions because we typically get one milieu. We get one group of characters who, who normally are relatively homogeneous. Because again, in reality, people of different, different sorts don't mix all that often. Um, I will confess that this is not, this is partly not just a matter of, of realism, but of bias that people tend to write about the world they know. And so people don't tend to know multiple um, social milieu. But by giving us these 10 moments and by including within them repeated references to the history of African Americans over a long span, we get something more than any one play gives us. We get this sense of the complexity of African Americans' relationships to each other and to the white society in which they live. Do you think that the play is more limited in that way than the novel, for instance? Well, no, I don't. I, 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 some of those stuff, the things that I've worked on um, have this ability despite, like, um, I'm thinking of a, a novel by Rabia Ahmedzin called The Angel History. And there's one character that's based around, and it's moments from this character's life, um, but there's this ability, there's this expansiveness, which like, because the historical milieu in which this character is moving is one that affects such a large like, amount of people. Right? No, so the, so, so theater, theater really, uh, is unlikely given commercial um, realities and audience attention spans ever to be able to produce the, that, the complexity of narrative fiction in that way, or, or even the complexity of long-form TV shows like The Wire, which, which resemble narrative fiction much more than they resemble other TV shows or, or movies. Um, but uh, Wilson is able to use theater to do things that uh, not a lot of other playwrights have been able to do. Um, okay, thank you very much, and thank you, David. It was really uh, a wonderful talk. And if you want to come uh, hear David talking about The Wire, show us some clips from The Wire, come on uh, Thursday at 11 uh, in this room. And uh, uh, my class, uh, uh, my uh, American literature class, will be joining in and, and uh, watch.